By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And it is Tuesday, so that means more action for you from the Timmy Talks Brawl Fest. We're still playing Brawl. This is episode number four, and we have reached the quarter final. So this is a top eight match, and it's going to be between Tetsuo Umezawa, and that is the deck from Nathan. And he's taking on Bus, and he's playing with Solkanar, the Swamp King. And that means that both players are playing with the exact same color combination. So it's going to be interesting to kind of see the different approaches because the decks do have differences. I don't think it's a coincidence that we're seeing this color combination reaching so far in the tournament. Looking at the results, I have to say that red, black, and blue is definitely in the top two of strongest color combinations, and maybe it is the strongest color combination. Maybe you also remember episode one where you saw my deck in action. I've chosen to go with a commander with only two colors, thinking that it would make my deck more consistent. But looking at the results and looking at how people are playing and looking at the match videos, I've kind of come back on that um, conclusion because I think that a three, playing a three color commander is better and very doable if you adjust your deck to it. And of course, if you have the right color Moxen and Thower Stones and other little gadgets to kind of help you assemble the right colors, let me know how you feel about that in the comments below. So do you also feel that a three color commander is simply better in Brawl than going for a two color commander or going for a monocolored commander. Although I think monocolored is a different discussion because there are some cool things you can do when you go mono. But anyway, I can talk about this for, for hours and not even show you the game, and I'm sure you're here for the actual action. Talking about that, uh, if you wanna go straight to the game, there's a really simple way to do that. Check the description below, and there you will find several timestamps. One of those timestamps reads MTG Game. So click on there, that will take you straight to the action. And also in the description below, you can find more information about this specific rule set, about Brawl, about old school Brawl. So if you're curious about that, check out the description below. And uh, here I'm going to continue with the deck deck, and I'm gonna start with the deck of Nathan Tetsuo Umezawa. Let's take a look. And here we see the deck of Nathan. So he's playing Tetsuo as his commander and then his lieutenant here on, on this picture. So just a card in his deck is Solkanar the Swamp King. So maybe first uh, focus a little bit on Tetsuo. So Tetsuo is one blue, one black, and one red for a 3-3. Three, three. So that's great value for your buck. So bang for your buck, as they say. So if you've got the right color combination, you have a 3-3 three, three, a turn three, maybe even faster if you run into the right mocks or whatever. So that is really, really good. And then also the ability is really, really good. Although it's kind of costly. One red, double black, one blue and tap, destroy target tapped creature or target blocking creature. So it's argu arguably slightly better than a Royal Assassin that we also see in his deck. And then there's another cool little ability that is very relevant. Tetsuo may not be a target of an enchant creature spell. Now that means that you cannot play control magic on it and that makes it really good because a lot of people play with control magic in this format, including Nathan himself. And why is control magic good in a singleton format, you ask? That's very simple because you can only play with one disenchant if you play with white. So you simply have less answers to enchantments. So in general, you could say enchantments are stronger in this singleton kind of format, in these type of formats. Looking at the rest of the deck, we see an interesting bunch of black cards. I think he's committed to the color black the most. The reason I say this is because Tetsuo obviously needs double black to activate, but also look, look at that list. Look at those creatures, Sengi Vampire, Royal Assassin, Hypnotic Spectre. They all need a double black to activate. I also really like that one Nettling Imp there. I think Nettling Imp, beautiful art, really cool card, one black and two to cast. You can tap it, it's a one one. You can tap it and you can force targeted creature of the opponent to attack which is really nice. It's a great old school combination with Royal Assassin because you can force the opponent to attack with the creature. To attack, you have to tap the creature, usually, you know, except it's a Sarah Angel or the Ocean Soldier or anything, but usually you have to tap it. And then, of course, Nathan can tap his Royal to kill it, but also it works great with Tetsuo. It also works great with Icy Manipulator that we see in this deck because if you tap the creature with Icy first and then force it to attack, it cannot attack as it's tapped and it's actually gonna die, that actually works. So it's a really nice killing machine as well. And again, Royal Assassin Icy works really, really well. Obviously the downside of these creatures is they're very, very vulnerable. So if they can stay alive long enough, 
it can be a real pain for Bus, his creatures, if he has any. But I'm not going to talk about Bus's deck yet. Anyway, um, looking at the rest of his creature base, we see in red a lonely Setch Troll. That's the only creature there. In blue, we see a lonely Surrendip Afrit. And both of these creatures are very easy to cast, right? It's only one red and two to cast the Setch, and only one blue and two to cast the Surrendip. And both creatures, again, a lot of value for their CMC. You know, only for three, you could potentially get a 3-3 three, three regeneration creature and a 3-4 flyer. So flying is great evasion in old school. So I think there is this, this part of his deck that can roll out really quickly. And, um, you know, that that's probably what he's hoping for. Get some of these creatures out early and then have his counter magic. We see a lot of counter magic there. We see your mana drain, power sink. We see that card from Legends that can only counter creature spells. I forgot the name, but it's in there too. We see a spell blast. We see a force spike. I love force spike. Force spike counters anything, but your opponent can pay one to cancel that. So force spike is just really annoying. And when you t time it right, people are always going to be like, oh man, he's got that force spike. He's got a force spike. So as long as you've got one blue open, you always have that imminent danger of maybe casting a force spike. I kind of I kind of like that. We don't see force spike often, maybe not often enough, because a lot of uh, old school decks play really on their curve, right? They they want to do something every single turn, so they tap out every single turn, and that means you've got a chance to kind of get a good force spike in there. Anyway, uh, looking at that other row, so we've got a row of creatures. Well, first we've got that row of mana bases, right, where we see the moxen and the lands. Then we've got that row of creatures that we just discussed, and now we're at the row of the spells, you could say. So we see Control Magic, we see kind of see the, the usual suspects in the deck. There's nothing really that stands out to me that I think, oh, that is an interesting decision. It's very, um, I can understand, it's very straightforward. Maybe it's nice to kind of mention the Paralyze again. It goes really well with the Royal Assassin and with the Netling Imp and with Tetsuo. So that's kind of nice to have that tap down theme coming back in his deck all the time. And then we've got the bottom layer where we see the artifacts and the special lands. So we see uh, uh, Maze of If, of course, and we see Strip Mine, Strip Mine. You have to probably just have to play that in every deck. Um, nice looking Chaos Orb. And we do see two artifact creatures, by the way, including the Triskelion. I think Triskelion is very good in this format because there are just a lot of pesky 1-1s one -ones and Trike can't get rid of them. And it's just Triskelion in so many situations it is a two for one. It is really a better card than you think. Well, I guess it's now everybody knows it because it sees so much play, but there used to be a time when people like myself as well looked at this creature, thought six mana for a four, four that doesn't even have flying. What worthless. It is so good. Anyway, uh, we, we see it here. So these are this is the deck of Nathan. These are his cards. That is what I'm trying to say. Um, interesting. Looks like a strong deck. Not surprised that it reached the top eight. Now we're going to look at the deck of his opponent, Boss. Let's go. And here we see the deck of Boss. And um, yeah, Boss, I already see what you want to do. I'm not surprised. I think, Boss, you really love this card, don't you? Uh, and I'm not talking about Solkanar the Swamp King, which is his commander. You probably like that card too. But I'm really talking about the Abyss. The Abyss, one black and three to cast for an enchant world that reads, at the beginning of each player's upkeep, destroy target non-artifact creature that player controls of their choice and it can't be regenerated. So what the Abyss basically does, as soon as he has it on board, you know, Nathan will have to start sacking his beautiful army. Remember, he only plays with two artifact creatures and Bus in the place with a lot of artifact creatures. Well, actually, it's not a lot. I shouldn't exaggerate, but he's playing with, uh, you can see it there, the top Triskelion, uh, Jade Statue, which is a statue that you can make into a creature, uh, Tetravis and Juggernaut, right? So those are four artifact creatures. He's also playing with an often troll. He's also playing with the Surrender Perfreed in blue there, and he's playing with an Atok and a Setch troll. So I think, you know, he's playing with artifact creatures and to regenerate creatures, and Atok is just super annoying to play against, I know from experience. Um, and he's got that Surrender. So he's not all that much into creatures. He's really more into kind of controlling the board i can i think this deck is a bit more looking at it now i think this deck is a bit more controlling than nathan's and nathan's is a bit more uh mid-range i think if i have to make a difference maybe first kind of zoom into Solkanar, kind of looking at that commander so Solkanar, uh one blue one black one red and two to cast for a five five and it's got swamp walk and it reads Solkanar's controller gains one life each time a black spell is cast so 
it's it's a nice little life gain. It's a 5 5 for 5, pretty good value. It's a bit slower than the Tetsuo. It's got Swamp Walk, which could be relevant because Nathan is playing with Swamps, but of course, Nathan also has a Sulkanar in his deck. So, yeah, uh, it can be kind of interesting. They're both really good commanders. I think that, you know, Nathan can win this if he goes a little bit faster um, than Bus, and Bus can win it if he can kind of, you know, stabilize and do his thing with the Abyss, I guess. Uh, looking at the rest of the deck, we see it is, uh, there's a lot of power in here. We see the three colored Moxon, we see the Time Walk, Ancestral Recall, we see the Recall. Recall gets a lot better when you're playing with these Power 9 cards and these Restricted cards. If you're not playing with those, then reconsider adding Recall. Recall is not a no-brainer, in my opinion, you know? It's a good card, especially in this deck, but it's not a no-brainer. Um, then we're seeing a lot of damage. We're seeing Pestilence, which I think is a really good inclusion, especially with all those regeneration creatures and, and also with Mistress Factory. That's a nice combination. Pestilence, a little bit underplayed. You don't see it that often. Two black and two to cast for an enchantment. When you play, pay one black, you deal one damage to each player and each creature. And it's really great to kind of wipe out everything of your opponent. And it's also great to win the game when you're ahead on life. So it's it's a really good control tool. I'm, I'm actually quite... I think Pestilence should see more play. The card next to it, by the way, Greed, is another card that doesn't see so much play. But it's, again, it's actually quite good. It's uh, one black and three. And you can pay a black, pay two life to draw a card. So it's just one black mana to draw a card. And I know you do have to pay some life. So that's the downside. We do see an Ivory Tower in this deck, which I think is a really nice combination. If you've got Ivory Tower and you've got enough cards in hand together with your Greed, you've got a nice little card engine going there. Obviously, there is a danger in this deck that Boss can get too greedy and basically deal himself too much damage that he'll eventually die. Remember, his opponent Nathan is playing with a lot of burn as well. So that could be risky. You know, when you're playing against these players with red... You have to be kind of modest with your use of greed. You have to really know what you're doing. But I'm sure Boss knows what he's doing because he's reached the uh, the top eight. Maybe another nice thing to mention here is I always like to, to see that because, well, I'm not sure if I like to see that, but let me put it this way. It takes me back to 1995 when I started Magic. Um, is Black Vice and a Draw 7 spell. That has been something that has been done so often and it always gives me a flashback to the old games. It was one of the first little combos and synergies that people used to play. So you've got the Vice on the board, right? With Vice, target player who has more cards in hand than four during the upkeep takes a damage for every card above four. So if you've got seven in hand, you take three damage. It's as simple as that. That works great with draw seven spells, right? When it's your turn and you've got the Vice on the board, you can play out your Wheel of Fortune. Both players are gonna get a fresh seven. You pass a turn to your opponent and he's gonna take three damage because there's the Vice. And we see Wheel of Fortune here, but we also see the Time Twister. So he's got two ways of, um, you know, forcing his opponent to draw some cards. And this could actually be relevant. Like, I've, I've, I've seen it in matches, winning games very, very often. I actually got beaten by that not too long ago in a semifinal match. So, Will, Wilfred, if you're listening, that was kind of frustrating. Anyway, um, this is the deck of Boss. We've looked at the deck of Nathan, so now it's time to jump into the first quarterfinal. Let's go and take a look at his top eight match. Game number one is about to begin. We've got Nathan on the left with Tetsuo Umezawa, and on the right we've got Boss with Sulkanar the Swamp King. Brawl battle top eight, game number one, and here we see Boss. Apparently, he's on the play here, starting with a Mistress Factory and a Mox Sapphire. Decent start here, or a good start, I should say. Oh, look at Nathan go! Oh, ho! Mox Jet, Mox Ruby, Underground Sea, Tetsuo, turn one! Wow, that's brutal. Now, Boss needs to find an answer. Of course, he can block on his Mistress Factory if he would attack and pump the Factory itself and kind of trade it for the Tetsuo. That will set him back a land, though. He's got a full hand, full grip of cards. Okay, there's your answer. Maze of If being played by Boss the Card from the Dark. And that is a good answer. You can just send the Tetsuo back. If Nathan chooses to attack there, we see a basic mountain here by Nathan. What is he going to do? Untapping that Mox Jet again. Looks like he's got some options. A little bit in the tank. Not sure what to do. Okay, tapping, tapping, tapping. Four mana tap. There's an Icy Manipulator. That, of course, can solve that Maze of If problem. Let's see if Boss can now find an answer. Playing a basic mountain. 
Tapping two, there's an Atog. Very annoying creature. Card from the Antiquities, a one, two, and you can sack an artifact to give it plus two, plus two until end of turn. There's a strip mine. Wow. And now he can tap down the Atog swinging for three. Is he going to do that? He can also choose to tap the Atog on the end step. Playing a Shatter here. It gets even worse for Boss. Of course, Boss second the Sapphire to the Atog, making it a 3 4. And then the Atog gets tapped, and there's three damage coming in. Boss going to 17 here. So things are looking really, really good for Nathan. And Boss has to go, f go dig for answers again. Tapping three. Okay, this works. <laughs> Wheel of Fortune. And there we see, is he losing a Chaos Orb there for Nathan? It went pretty fast. He is losing a Sengir Vampire. Drawing seven new cards. And here we see Boss finding some jewelry. Mox Ruby, Mox Jet. Goes perfectly with that Atok. Of course, the, um, the Icy is still on the battlefield, and that could be a problem for Boss. He already played out of land, so he passed his turn here. He's got five cards in hand. Nathan playing out a basic island. And I believe he could... He got, needs two black. He could tap the Atok here and kill it with Tetsuo's ability. Question is, does he want to? Looks like he's in the tank again, tapping down. No, he has that two black and one for a hippie, perhaps. Doing it again. Yep, there's the Hypnotic Spectre, 2-2. Two, two. And of course, a big problem with the Hypnotic... Ooh, Time Walk! This is so good! Nathan is really finding his power cards. Oh man, he can swing in here and, I mean, Bus is gonna lose something here. Paralyzed, make matters even worse. He's not gonna kill the Atok with the Tetsuo. Instead, he's going to go for the offensive here, dealing 5 damage, boss dropping to 12, and of course he has to discard a card at random because of that Hypnotic Spectre. So he's going to lose a Jam Day Tome. Ooh, that's a pretty good card. Man, and now boss has to start bouncing back from this. There we see a Jaloom Tome, and he's got enough mana open to use the Jaloom as well. Two and tap to draw a card, and then you have to discard a card. That is what Jalum Tome does. And now Bus has to choose. Am I going to discard the Atok, or untap, I mean, the Atok, because of the Paralyzed that's on it, choosing not to, playing out a Soul Ring instead. Tapping. Oh, also a Time Walk here from Bus. Oh, and a Mind Twist. So Bus is really has a strong comeback. Look at that. Remove Soul, Disintegrate, and a Basic Swamp. Go to the bin here for Nathan. What an exciting game this is. Both players fighting their power cards, having really good responses. This game is going up and down so fast. Bus tapping four here, and ooh, an abyss. Oh, this is a big problem for Nathan. There we see a Chaos Orb as well. Is he going to flip? Perhaps on the Icy Manipulator. That's still a big problem. Or does he want to keep his card, of course? He could also flip on the Hypnotic Spectre. Depends on what's in his hand. Looks like he is activating the orb. I mean, if he values the card in hand, he goes for the Hippie. If he values uh, getting ahead on board, he goes for the Icy. Yeah, he goes for the Hippie here. The reason I'm saying that is that he's got to sack the Hippie eventually anyway. So now Nathan takes on his turn. In his upkeep, he's got to sack a non-artifact creature. So there goes Tetsuo back to the command zone. The way the command zone works, it's got a counter on it now. And next time he, he wants to play it out, he has to pay two extra. And there we see a mind twist. Oh, I kind of missed that. That went really fast. A mind twist by Nathan. And we see Boss there discarding his Jade statue and also losing his Atok to his own abyss. Now taking his turn, animating the factory. Factory getting tapped by the IC and passing turn here. And there is Nathan using his little book. So now he's got a discarded card throwing away. It looks like a volcanic island. It's kind of hard to see with the glare. And a pass turn by Nathan. And Boss, what can he do? Finding a strip mine. Is he going to use it? Maybe he just wants to keep it. It looks like he's going to use it. Using it on a basic mountain. I'm a little bit surprised here. I wonder why he's going for the basic mountain and not, for example, for the underground sea. I mean, Nathan still has that Mox Ruby. So he still has access to red, and he's discarding a card now. Again, it's hard to see. And passing turn. There we see Demonic Tutor by Boss. 
interesting. What is he going to look up? I think, he, I mean, he's got a couple of options, right? Ancestral Recall would be a great card because you want to draw some cards in, his hand's empty. But also maybe a Shatter for that Icy Manipulator because then he can start dealing damage with his uh, Mishra's uh, Factory. So I wonder what he's going to go for. Brain Geyser, but he doesn't have double blue anymore. Anime dead to perhaps get back a fatty, but what's really in, in there that you want to get back? A recall, but a recall is, again is taking two blue and you got to discard cards from your hands. It's kind of card disadvantage. So I think most likely is Ancestral Recall here or a card to get rid of that Icy Manipulator. I don't believe he plays with um, Steel Artifact. Again, Steel Artifact, also one of those cards that's double blue. I really like Steel Artifact in, in singleton formats. He's going through his deck now. Maybe he doesn't know yet. Maybe he's also trying to find something. He could, he could even go for a trike. I mean, a trike works really nice with the Abyss, but of course you still have to deal with that Icy Manipulator. I guess we're going to find out soon enough. You know, if it's, if it's a Shatter or Ancestral Recall, he can play it out straight away. If not, he's going to keep it in hand and keep playing an Island. So he has access to double blue. Oh, a Tetravus. Of course, Tetravus. He can make that into 4-1-1 Flyers. Oh, a 4 Spike! Oh, ho, ho. Such a nice play. I said it in the intro when we, when I was discussing Nathan's deck. I like Force Spike. And here you see why I love Force Spike. Oh, man. And this is so important. This this Force Spike is so important. Because I have to say, I didn't think about Tetravis Bus. I think it's a really good decision to go for Tetravis, you know. But, uh, yeah, there was Force Spike. And there's another book, by the way, by Nathan, Jaloom Tome. Uh, sorry, Jam Day Tome. And that's going to give him some cards. This is perfect for Nathan. He's kind of back in it. Still has to find a way to deal with that Abyss, though, because he's got a lot of, you know, colored creatures. He's got a lot of black creatures in his deck that he'll have to sack to the Abyss, so it's not ideal. Then again, he does have a couple of... Uh, he does have a couple of, uh, of artifact creatures, and he does have direct damage in deck. You know, boss is on 12, so... It's, 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 it's still it's looking okay-ish, you know? I mean... It's just great when you're in the standstill, but you're the player who has a Jam de Tome and a Jalem Tome. We do see an Ivory Tower here on the side of Bus, by the way, but he only has two cards in hand. So that Ivory Tower is not a very big threat at the moment. I wonder what Nathan's going to do. Looks like he's just passing turn four cards in hand. We see Bus going to three cards here. And passing turn. And boom, now he's going to five cards. Just Nathan keeps drawing extra cards because of his jam day tome. And just passing turn. And that's three cards and a pass. So we're still in that still mate. But again, you know, Nathan is drawing twice as many cards as Boss. So eventually, you know, that should start giving him the advantage. Boss dropping to nine here because of that uh, lightning bolt. So he's really just going for the direct damage plan. He's, he's playing chain lightning as well, I believe. He's lost Disintegrate in the bin. I think there's also a Fireball in there. So he's, he's got some firepower left. And of course, he's also playing with the Trike. He's also playing with the Juggernaut. So he's got a couple of options to work around that Abyss. Three cards in hand for Boss here. You can see that by the white dice he's got. Tapping four. Okay, there we see a Greed. That's nah, not ideal, you know. I mean... He really doesn't want to lose more life. Mana Drain. I'm a little bit surprised by this Mana Drain, to be honest. I, I agree. It is, in a way, dangerous, you know, because he can start finding the cards that he needs to take the game. On the other hand, you can keep the Mana Drain to counter those cards and say, you know what, boss? You're on nine. You know, go ahead. Take damage. <laughs> you know, he can only activate the Greed four more times. Then he's on one. And we see Nathan here, and using the big book and the small book, that's how I call them, Jalum Tome being the small one. There is a Psionic Blast, and now he's on five. What else can he do here? And there's a Fireball, and this is game. Yep, that's it. The writing was on the wall, wasn't it? At the moment that Nathan was in this situation where he just drew twice as many cards as boss, you kind of know eventually... He's going to float on top. He's going to win this one. So winning game number one, but what an entertaining game it was. It's just, 
Wow, great man, a great tech commercial for Brawl actually. And now both these players are gonna shuffle up again and we'll catch up with them in game number two. Game number two, here we go. So one up for Nathan, that means boss again on the play. Starting with the vice, always nice. Passing turn, it means three damage probably here. Yeah, three damage for Nathan, gonna drop to 17. Let's see what else he can do, starting with Mox Sapphire. That's pretty good, kind of emptying his hand that way. So at least he goes down to six with that Swamp as well in passing turn. So that means two damage, not too shabby. There's an underground C by Boss and a time walk. Okay, wow. Very good start here by Boss. Again, the four spike. <laughs> oh man, you gotta love that four spike. Now I wanna start playing with four spike. Again, we see an early Tetsuo, this time turn two for Nathan. So he's finding the right manas, wow. And it looked like such a good opener again for Boss, but um, man. Nathan is just topping it every time. Boss now, of course, taking his turn. What can he do? Playing out a Swamp here and finding Chaos Orb. Is he gonna flip on the Tetsuo or is he gonna flip maybe on the land? Or is he just gonna wait? Maybe waiting is, is a better option. Although slowing him down by flipping on one of his mana sources could be interesting as well. I would probably flip on one of his lands, to be honest, kind of cut a color. And then the question is which one? Perhaps blue, because then he cannot play the blue power. I wonder what he's going to do. Maybe he's going to flip on Tetsuo. Who knows? Anyway, yeah, okay, he's going to flip on Tetsuo. And he's going to go back to the command zone. So that means that Nathan now needs to go for five mana if he wants to recast it. And there we see a strip mine on the underground sea. So no more blue mana anymore for boss. And of course, also some damage for Nathan dropping to 15. And... Uh, now he's dropping to 14, it seems. There is another Swamp. Wonder what he's gonna do, tapping three here. Is there another, oh, not the Hypnotic Spectre. He is finding a Royal Assassin instead. We also have that Maze of If, by the way, on the side of Boss, and now playing a second Mountain. And he's gonna untap four cards in hand, so the Vice does nothing anymore, at least not now. Remember, Boss has a lot of draw, well, a lot. He's got two draw sevens with Wheel of Fortune and Time Twister. So he's now recasting Tetsuo, having five mana. And there we see a Mox Sapphire on the side of Boss. Tapping four, there's a Greed. Greed in this situation, very, very good. And there's no counter from Nathan. Now finding a second blue. And that Greed is gonna be nice for Boss. So Greed, a card originally from Legends. This is a reprint from 4th edition, I believe. There's an attack, sending it back, taking one damage from the Royals, who's gonna to drop to 19. For Greed, you pay one black and then pay two life and you get to draw a card. And it looks like Nathan perhaps wants to do something. No, he is passing the turn here. And now we see Boss drawing an extra card with the Greed, gonna to go to 17. Playing out another Swamp so he can go to 15, draw another card. That's kind of what I'm expecting here, unless he's got a good play. And, okay, tapping four. Oh, playing a Jade Statue. Okay, that's an alternative. Jade Statue, an artifact, and uh, for two mana, you can make it into a 3-6 creature, Golem. And you can only do that during combat. So it's kind of this, it's a really cool card. It hasn't been reprinted after Unlimited. Really nice art, really like the card. There we see some more lands being played by Nathan here. I wonder what he's gonna do. I mean, attacking is, is that still interesting? Yeah, of course he doesn't have enough mana to animate the Jade Statue. So that means one, one more damage for boss. Guess that's the right thing to do here by Nathan. Three cards in hand, it seems, for boss here. Is he gonna start using the Greed again? Or does he have better options? Tapping his black mana. Is he gonna, ooh, stone rain. What is he gonna stone? Of course, the only mountain that he has. So taking away the access to red for Nathan. He can also cast Solkanar next turn, boss. Remember, Solkanar is swamp walk. But of course, the problem is boss has and Royal and Tetsuo, so, I mean, uh, Nathan. Okay, always a good card to draw into. The Triskelion here on the side of Nathan. 
a 4-4 with three plus one plus one counters that you can shoot off to deal one damage to any target for each counter. Not really a target here on the board though for Nathan. And there we see Boss on the end step drawing an extra card with Greed dropping to 14. So it's kind of annoying here for Boss. He needs to kind of get rid of the Tetsuo and the Royal. And again, for, for Nathan, it's quite annoying because he can't really attack. There's that maze, there's the Jade Statue. So both players kind of stuck at the moment. We see Boss tapping. Is that two blue, two red, perhaps? Control Magic? Wonder what he's going to do here. Two blue, two. Oh, he's tapping everything. Tetravis, perhaps? Of course, four spikes already gone. Yep, Tetravis. And of course, yeah, Tetravis is nice, but Tetravis versus Strike is not ideal. He cannot attack with it either because of the Royal and the Tetsuo. So both players really, really stuck here. And this could, this could, we could be in for a long game here. There's an attack, interesting. I find this a little bit surprising here. Because, of course, Boss can block with the Tetravis. He could, for example, block Tetsuo, but it's probably more likely to block the Royal Assassin here. And then Nathan can take off the three plus one plus one counters to kill. So he is blocking the Royal here. So Royal's gonna die, and then he's gonna use the counters to kill the Tetravis. Okay, so he's basically saying, I'm gonna trade my Royal and three of my counters for the Tetravis. I'm not sure if that's a great deal. It's not the worst. Then again, of course, if you're in Nathan's position, you're looking at Boss who's drawing extra cards with the Greed and you're kind of worried about that. You know that he's got card advantage over you. So then you want to be the aggressor. So from that perspective, it does make sense what Nathan does here. But next turn, he can't really deal any damage to Boss still. You know, Maze of If again, such a good card. And we see Boss now going through his hand. What could he do? Tapping four, okay. Playing a fireball on the Tetsuo, I assume. So Tetsuo goes back. The problem here is that Oh, Nathan doesn't have access to red, of course. Oh, there is no problem. I want to say the problem is that Nathan can recast it next turn, but he can. So this is a good move here. Animating the Jade Statue. So attacking with this 3-6 creature, that probably means exactly Nathan's going to take more damage. He's going to drop to 11. There's an Underground C. There's an Animate Dead. Ooh. So he's going to take back, he's going to take the Tetravis back. Interesting. So now he's got a blocker again. And the good news here for Nathan is he can make those, the Tetravis into three 1-1 one, one flyers and an 0-1 oh, flyer. And then he can start attacking with three little 1-1s. One, and then that Maze of If doesn't look so good anymore. There we see a Juggernaut. Okay. That is a problem for Nathan. Because does he want to trade to Juggernaut for the Tetravis? And we see an attack here with the Jade Statue. Remember, Jade Statue being a 3-6, it's huge. I don't think Nathan wants to block this one. Probably just going to take the damage or chomp with the Trike. If he takes the damage, he drops to 8. And Oh, it looks like he just blocked on the Tetravis, of course. Tetravis is a 3-4. Sorry, I wasn't... <laughs> I thought it was a 3-3, three, three, but because Anime Dead only does minus 1, minus 0, oh, not minus 1, minus 1. So it was a 3-4. So no problem here, of course, for Nathan just to block. Now he's taking off the little Tetravite, so he's got three 1-1 one, one flyers. I wonder what he's going to do. Ancestral Rico, but Boss, ooh, they could be, this could be the moment in the game where Boss takes over. Of course, he's got to attack with the Juggernaut. But it's looking like a pretty pretty good attack. Probably also going to attack with the Jade Statue, unless he's got better options in hand. Remember, he just drew three extra cards off of his Ancestral Recall. 
So he's got, you know, Nathan's got an 0-1 flyer that he's probably going to chump with. He's got three 1-1 flyers, and he's got a 1-1 trike. Uh, sorry, Triskelion. Yeah, trike, same thing. So I wonder what he's going to do here. I think if I would be Nathan, I would just chump the Juggernaut with my 0-1 and maybe take the three damage. I don't know. Another option, of course, is do the Jade Statue with the 01 and, you know, bite the bullet and just tap or block the Juggernaut on three 1 1 creatures. Looks like that's what he's doing. Yes, he's going to bite the bullet. He's going to say, you know what? Here you go. And he is taking the three damage. Interesting. There is a Surrendip of Freets. Things are looking really good for Boss here. Nathan cannot find that red mana to recast the Tetsuo because Tetsuo is such a great defense. Cannot recast it though. And he's on 13. I wonder what he's going to do. Probably just going to animate the Jade statue and attack with both. That's kind of a no brainer here. He's looking at his hand. Paying two here, two blue. No one tapping it again. And only attacking. Interesting. Only attacking with the Surrendip. I'm a little bit surprised. He probably then has a play to make. Exactly, he does. Tapping five. Oh, he plays Sulkanar. Of course, he still has Sulkanar. <laughs> I completely forgot about his commander. I'm like... He didn't play it out anyway, but that's a great option. Solkanar, of course, having Swamp Walk, and also he gains life every time a black spell comes into play, which could be nice. There we see a Juggernaut. So the Juggernaut is not going to do much here. And, okay, he's saying, you know what? You've got this one. Look at that. He had a Fireball in hand and a Red Elemental Blast. So the decision of Bust to take away the Red was a great one. You know, that really helped. That means it's a 1-1. And we're going to go to game number three. Game number three, the decider. The winner of this game is moving on in Timmy's Brawl Fest and is moving on to the semifinals. This is a top eight match. So there's a lot at stake here. And there we see Boss putting a card on the bottom of his library. And Nathan, of course, he can start because he lost the last game. So he finally can be on the play here. Let's see... What he can do with that, playing a Badlands, Demonic Tutor turn two, not too shabby. I wonder again what he's going to look up, perhaps a blue source, a source, a Mox Sapphire. It so depends on what's in his hand, right? That's so crucial to what he's going to look up now. Shuffling up. I mean, if it's the Mox Sapphire, he's probably going to play it out straight away. And it looks like he's passing turn here. Okay, so Boss taking on turn, playing a Mountain, tapping two, or just attacking for two. Okay, so Nathan going down to 18. There we see a City of Brass, Mox Jet. Now he can cast his Tetsuo. Is he going to do that? It looks like he is. Yep, there's the Tetsuo. And passing turn here. Maybe he looked up the City of Brass. That's also an option, of course. City of Brass is really good when you're playing with... Uh, ooh, there's a Lightning Bolt on Tetsuo Umezawa and the Surrender Perfreet. Really good turn here for Boss, taking care of the commander of Nathan and also playing a 3-4 Flyer, a powerhouse in old school. Nathan has to find an answer. He's still pretty high up, so no immediate worries. But uh, playing out nothing is not great, of course. Passing the turn here to Boss. Bus dropping to 19. There is the Red Elemental Blast after Bus has taken the damage. So that is a good answer from Nathan. So Nathan playing a Red Elemental Blast main. Um, one of the things I like about Brawl is that it's without a sideboard. And uh, that always kind of... It, it means you kind of get into a flow when you're playing. I do find sideboarding an interesting aspect of the game. But in these formats, I kind of like it without a sideboard. And here we see Jade Statue being played by Bus. So Bus is finding the Jade Statue a lot. And every time I see Jade Statue in action, I'm thinking, oh, it's actually better than I thought. And there we see a Set Stroll, a card that I know is really good. 3-3, uh, three, three, well, 2-2, two, two, but it gets plus 1, plus 1 if you control a Swamp. And you can also regenerate it for a Swamp. 
a really good card, a card that you see a lot in old school and very difficult to deal with. You really need that Swords to Plowshares to get rid of it. But for Boss, it's not ideal. But then again, I mean, he can block on a Jade Statue. The problem here for Boss, I guess, is he doesn't have a, a Swamp. Because casting Solkanar right now would be perfect, but he doesn't have a Swamp. Playing a Recall? Okay, interesting. And he's getting back both of his cards. So Lightning Bolt and a Surrender Pafrit. And passing turn here. So that is pretty good. He can recast the Surrender. And it's also really nice to have that Bolt in hand for when Nathan recasts his, uh, his commander. And also really annoying for Nathan to know, right? If I'm going to recast, he's just going to Bolt it again. And I'm expecting the Surrender now. Yeah, there we see the Surrender of Freed again. Are we going to see a counter spell? Remove Soul, perhaps? Yep, remove Soul from Legends. Taking care of business. Really nice to see cards like Remove Soul. You usually don't see them in other formats because obviously you would prefer just playing with four counter spells or, you know, some other form of counter magic. Power Sync also quite popular, but it's, it's nice to see Remove Soul. And in a creature heavy format, which I think Brawl usually is, it, it is handy. Here we see a Jam Day Tome by Nathan. And we saw the Gem Day Tome kind of giving Nathan the win in game one. So it is a very strong card. Of course, that was a different scenario. And Nathan, it looks like he's on 14 still. And Boss, he's still on 19. So both players pretty high up. There he's animating the Jade Statue. Interesting block, at least taking a damage. Will we see... Oh, there's that Lightning Bolt that he still had, of course. Of course, and there's a copy artifact on the Jade Statue, or, or, no, probably on the Gem Day Tome, right? I want it to be on the Jade Statue, but it's probably going to be on the Gem Day Tome. There's an Icy Manipulator. Ooh, and maybe now Buster regrets that he didn't, uh, that he didn't wait with his uh, copy artifact. On the other hand, maybe a Gem Day Tome is better to have, because it gives you card advantage in the long run. He does have that Soul Ring as well. And it looks like he's a little bit in the tank here. Trying to find out what to do. Going through his hand, I believe. Is that then that red dice is on two? Does it mean he only has two cards in hand? What is he going to do here? And maybe the copy artifact is a jade statue. I mean, we'll find out soon enough, I guess. There he goes, animating his factory, attacking with his factory and with his uh, jade statue. And of course, Nathan in response, blocking the Jade Statue, taking two damage from the factory. So it's going to drop to 10 here. There we see a Juggernaut. And what's going to happen next? The Juggernaut's going to attack, but it doesn't look great with those Jade Statues. And Boss here, looking at his hand again. Then again, Nathan, of course, can use his Icy Manipulator to tap the Jade Statue when it gets activated. And that way, the Jade, uh, the, the Juggernaut can just, you know, attack and deal, deal its damage. Ooh, this, oh, he doesn't have black mana. The Satch Troll is now just a 2-2 and he doesn't have any black mana. So it's not 3-3, three, three, he cannot regenerate it. So this is a problem. There we see a tap of the Jade Statue. Does mean that Nathan takes a damage though. Gonna go to nine. Now he's gonna attack, of course, with the Juggernaut. There's a Chain Lightning on the Setch Troll. That's a good decision. There we see an attack. Oh, Cyblast taking care of Nathan's Juggernaut. Boss dropping to 17 here. But it's still looking pretty good for, uh, for Nathan. Of course, he's, he, is, he is pretty low on life. He's on nine. It's still everybody's game. Being four, there's a Juggernaut. Interesting. Wow, these players really give a good show. And is there going to be a Jam Day Tome? Okay, there's a Strip Mine on the factory. That makes perfect sense. Tapping and untapping a Swamp here. Taking another damage, gonna go down to eight. 
Is he just going to draw a card? I assume not, or else he wouldn't have used the City of Brass. Tapping six. Is he going to recast the Tetsuo here? Oh, he's going to cast a Brain Geyser. That's why he's like un untapping and tapping. He's wondering how many cards should I invest in my Brain Geyser? And uh, I believe he now draws four cards from the Brain Geyser. That's pretty decent. There's a Paralyze on the Juggernaut. Paralyze being so annoying because in your upkeep, you have to decide, do I want to pay four to untap my creature? And of course, Paralyze is great with the Icy Manipulator. Those two cards really make a good team. There is a Wheel of Fortune. Love it, boss. Love it. And is there a response here by Nathan? Is there perhaps a Lightning Bolt? If there's a Bolt, I would not do it on a Juggernaut, to be honest. There's a Bolt. Yeah, on the life total of boss. I think that's I think that's the decision I would have made. I'm not saying it's the right one, but that's I would have done the same, Nathan. Anyway, he's drawing into seven. Bus is drawing into seven. He's still got quite a lot of mana left. Don't think he played out a land yet. So he can still do that. So we'll have to wait and see what is Bus going to do here. Tapping a blue. Ancestral Recall, of course. Why not? This is really nice for Bus. Eh? Finding the Ancestral Recall... With seven in hand, that means he's got nine cards in hand right now. That's insane. I wonder what he's going to do with all those cards. The question as well is this, if Boss has any artifact removal, what is he going to use it on? On the book or on the icy? Okay, there's a Demonic Tutor. Wow, so that was a really good... He Found seven new cards, and in those seven cards, there was an Ancestral Recall, and maybe also a Demonic, although he maybe he also drew just, just drew into that Demonic. That's another option. And now again, we're going to go and guess what is Boss going to get with his Demonic. I'm just going to go for Artifact Removal again. I'm probably missing something. Maybe, in, mm, I want to say another copy Artifact, but this is a Singleton format, so he, <laughs> he, he, his only copy is on the board. I wonder... Maybe even a Time Twister. I mean, why not? Then again, no, oh, Time Twister would be kind of stupid. He still has got a lot of cards in hand. I think he's got eight cards in hand right now, if I'm not mistaken. No, seven, I guess, because he's not discarding anything. Okay, seven cards in hand, passing turn. There we see a Maze of If. That is pretty good. An anime dead. What is he going to look up here? Royal Assassin? Juggernaut? Juggernaut. Okay, so that's now a 4-3 Juggernaut. A little bit surprised. Yeah, of course, he can tap down. He's got that uh, Icy Manipulator, of course. And there we see a Surrender Afrit. So Nathan is really going to go for the aggressive plan, which makes sense in this case. He can use his Icy to tap down the Jade Statue. The Juggernaut is still being tapped down by the Paralyze. So this is not too bad. And in the end step, of course, Nathan can use his Icy. Five cards in hand for Nathan, and I believe still seven in hand for Boss here. So he's got a full grip of cards to deal with this situation. And his deck is filled with strong spells. An Abyss would at least help against the Serenip. That would solve one problem. We'll just have to wait and see here. Bust really being in the tank. I mean, remember, this is the deciding game of the quarterfinals of Timmy's Brawl Fest. We had 41 players competing. And if you check the description below, you can actually find a link to the tournament website where you can see all the deck photos. There's some really cool decks in there. And it looks like Boss has tapped three lands here. Is he going to tap more? Is he going to play his own Brain Geyser? Maybe he is. No, it's a huge fireball. 
So he's gonna play fireball for two, four, six, eight. Oh, is that the end of Nathan? Nathan's dead, fireball. Oh, I just, that took a moment for me to realize. Nathan's dead, he's a gunner. And that's probably why, you know, Bus was in the tank for so long. He knew, okay, Nathan's playing with a lot of counter magic. I've got to tap out to kill him. Am I going to take the risk? And he did, and it paid off. Congratulations, Bus. You are going to advance to the quarterfinals. Well done. Amazing work. And uh, wow, Nathan, you had the upper hand, man. You had the upper hand, but a fireball out of nowhere and no answer for it. It can happen to all of us. Anyway, this was the match for today. Thank you very much for watching another episode right here on Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And if you're new to the channel, welcome. Please subscribe and ring that bell. And if you just did so, thank you very much. You're really helping the channel mucho, mucho. YouTube finds it super importante. You know, they, they that stuff, they love that stuff, talking about it. You can also like this video, share it on your socials, and leave a comment. All that helps and is completely free. Now, there's one other thing you can do. You can also become a patron of the channel via Patreon and sponsor the channel financially as well. It already starts with $1. And how can you do that? It's really simple. You probably just saw an info card popping up. Click on that card. That will take you to the Timmy Talks Patreon page where you can find all the details. The cool thing is, if you join the Timmy Talks Patreon page, if you do, you get access to the Timmy Talks Discord server, so you can talk to all of us, all the players, everybody. Um, and you can also join in the Timmy Talks tournaments, like this Brawl Fest tournament. I organize tournaments every two months, three months, so, you, you know, at least four, five, six times a year, I try to organize something to thank you guys, the channel members and patrons for their support. So if you want to be part of that, check out the Timmy Talks Patreon. And another nice perk is your name will be in the end scroll. So at the end of every video, there's the end scroll with your name on it. Talking about that, let's go to the end scroll and let's take a look at our amazing, wunderbar, fantastic patrons and channel members. Ich kann das Fingertisch zum Bakasin.